Hey, what's up, y'all? Welcome to Q&A, the show where I take your questions and answer them here on YouTube. A ton of questions here to get into after what was a very frustrating weekend for many Ohio football fans. Hopefully, we have recovered. Hopefully, the day and the bye week and the no football this weekend uh, relaxes us and allows us to find our zen, our peace, our inner harmonious self. Uh, maybe we're going to do some quick calisthenics. Maybe we're going to do some stretches. We're going to do some breathing. You know what I mean? Um, but either way, we're going to be able to take a little bit of a break from all the stress that football has provided us throughout the 2021 year. Boy, I can't wait for it to be 2022. But we're going to start with a question from KTO. Y'all know who KTO is, one of the most popular football YouTubers or sports YouTubers um, on the platform. He's also a Browns fan. and He happened to just drop a question. He says, do you think one key difference in 2020 and the 2021 Browns could have been full stadiums uh, versus no crowds during 2020. A lot of the games last year felt like scrimmages with no crowd noise, which makes adjustments at the line easier. Everything can tighten up with the pressure of the crowd, both at home and on the road. Now, this is anecdotal uh, for what I'm about to say, at least my experience. Um, I know that from my experience dealing with like live crowds or being at live events, for a football stadium that's outdoors, 20,000 people are enough to make an impact on the game and 30,000 people are enough to be loud enough at any capacity to force bad communication, right? So that's what I have noticed from just watching a ton of college football or watching a ton of football period and being at a ton of football games. It's an anecdotal experience. I get that, but... It's going to come in handy when it comes to answering this question. So last year, I think the Browns might have played one game in front of over 20,000 people. And I believe that was the Kansas City game. Um, I don't know if the Tennessee game had 20,000 people. I know it might have been a close number. And I don't know if the last home game, I think it was 14,000. Either way... I think the only game where you can say crowd noise could have been a factor last year was um, the 2021 playoff game versus the Kansas City Chief. And honestly, some of these issues did pop up in those games. It didn't matter as much because, you know, coming out of that game, we talked about the penalty um, or the lack of penalty being called on Nick Sorsen. And, and we talked about, you know, the Chad Henney play. So we didn't talk about some of the false starts and some of the miscommunication stuff that happened in that game. But it was definitely there um, in that playoff game. So that kind of adds to KTO's theory here. And, yeah, I do think that, you know, they established a lot of these communication protocols um, under the guise of COVID. And they never really got to test it throughout a season with some real cr uh, crowd noise. And, you know, it's one of those things that are really messing with the team, amongst many other things, right? But I think it's definitely one of them. When you look at the lack of smooth operation, it's a lot easier to have a smooth operation when there's not enough crowd noise to affect that operation. But maybe what we're finding out here is one of the things that is wrong with this team, amongst many, is that their operations were not made in a way that can survive a very loud crowd, which happens if it gets established in the COVID year where there's nobody there. I would ha scratch my head a little bit that that hasn't been changed yet. I mean, it's week 12. You should be able to change that in 12 weeks um, if your communication stuff needs to be changed. It's a little bit of a red flag there. But yeah, it's definitely something I've noticed that the procedural stuff has been off um, whenever they get loud crowd noise. And it's part of the reason why even the team complains when we get loud crowd noise on the offensive side of the ball at home because, you know, it's clearly been a problem for them. But thank you for the question, KTO. Make sure y'all check out his channel. Next question comes from SFARC123 who says, hey, Q, um, is it just me or does the season eerily remind us of 2019, the expectations, the lack of disciplines with penalty, um, and the questionable play calling seems very reminiscent? Do you believe there will be serious discussions around developing a new offensive scheme, and will that come with acquiring a new QB in the offseason? Okay, 
there are some things that are very similar to 2019. I would not equate the play calling this year to 2019. The play calling has been something that some people have thought has been a big issue. And at times it is a big issue. Um, but it's not what 2019 was like. Freddie Kitchens was calling fake punts. He was doing like double end around reverses to nowhere. Um, like the stuff Freddie Kitchens was doing wasn't about how bad the play calling was necessarily, even though it was really bad. It was just like how fundamentally unsound everything they were doing was. And I get that this team doesn't have the greatest discipline in the world, but there's a level of soundness here that the, the Freddie Kitchens Browns just didn't possess here. This is just bad ideals or ideals that seem sound on paper not working out with this staff. Um, let the stuff of Freddie Kitchens was like, who in the world would try this? That That's a big difference between uh, Freddie and, and Kevin here. Um, but yeah, I get where there's similarities, where it's just a disappointment and the offense is the main driver of that disappointment now will it come with acquiring a new quarterback this offseason i wouldn't take it off the table at this point i don't think baker has played at a level where you can take that off the table what i do know is that baker's going to be here next year because you can't really get rid of him he has that fifth year extension you're not going to be able to cut him i doubt you're going to be able to trade him so you're pretty much you know you're going to have baker mayfield on the roster one way or the other what i do think they're going to do is they're going to upgrade that backup quarterback position and get Get somebody in there where there's going to be a little bit more of a competition in the offseason than there was this year, right? Case Keenum is not competition for the starting job. Case Keenum is Case Keenum. Um, and y'all know what that means if you watch this channel enough. I'm not the biggest fan of the world of Case Keenum. I don't think he can play NFL football at a, at a, at a decent level anymore. I really don't. Um, so, you know, they're going to upgrade that position because, you know, if Baker plays like this next year, they got to do something, right? Like, you can't let this go on for two straight years. Um, but you're also going to give him a chance to, to redeem himself from this season because you got a lot invested in Baker. So, you know, I think that's probably where the quarterback uh, situation is going to be going this year the next question comes from josh hopper who says hey q if worst case scenario occurred what would need to happen for the browns to fire kevin stefanski uh despite the down year i still think stefanski's a great coach do you think we'll still hold on to him for years to come yeah man kevin's bought himself a bad year right like he had the 11 to 5 season in some tough circumstances and they won a playoff game he has earned himself one bad year um, at, at the very least, right? He might have even earned himself two bad years. Um, but, yeah, absolutely, Kevin's coming back. You're not going to fire. Unless Kevin gets caught in some kind of, like, horrible scandal and has to be fired, he's not being fired. Like, he's not even on the hot seat. It, it's, it's, it would be ridiculous to fire Kevin at this point. I understand people are caught up in the disappointment of this year, but honestly, like, just – Look at what people are suggesting, right? Firing Kevin Stefanski is ridiculous. Uh, that would be ridiculous at this point. Um, so he's going to be here next year, right? Him and Baker, they're going to be here next year. Um, what the roles are going to be, well, I know Kevin's role is probably going to be the same, but what Baker's role is going to be, well, he's going to have to battle for that. We'll see what he does. Logan Maddox says, do you think have, not having Stump Mitchell since the huge game by Dearness Johnson has affected the run game? Not so much a question here, but I feel like the offense runs Nick Chubb in two predictable run sets to be effective. Not being able to run those plays um, with guards pulling has affected his production too. Here is the deep and dirty secret about the run game. Any team that runs the ball 30 times a game is going to be predictable because running the ball is fairly predictable, right? That's why a lot of teams opt to pass. Or if you're going to run the ball a lot, you got to you got to mix it in with heavy play action, which the Browns are doing right now. Um, but running the ball is predictable, right? Remember when Tony Romo was starting off um, at CBS and he made the big catchphrase of like, oh, there's going to be a run to the left. Oh, there's going to be a run to the right. There's a reason why Tony Romo can do that with these because run plays are predictable. They have to be predictable with their setup. That's how they work. They're predictable. There are a couple of run plays you can pull out of nowhere, uh, like a draw or some reverse counters. But that's probably going to be like, what, two, three run plays a game? You know, maybe you'll run an end around in a game. Maybe it's four. 
But other than that, the run game is predictable. It's been predictable since the start of football. If you're going to run the football a lot, you're going to be predictable. That is what it is, right? Like, that's how that works. That's how running the football works. So, you know, the run game being predictable, not really excuse for what Nick Chubb did on Sunday. You know, Nick Chubb's got to be better than that. The offensive line has to be better than that. But that's how run games work. The reason it's hard to have a very good run game in the NFL is because it's predictable and because you have to run the ball when teams know you're going to run it and that requires you to be very, just better than the other team run game it's fairly predictable um they're pretty easy things to cite well, you know when it comes to the run game being predictable there is no way to make it unpredictable unless you're going to run a ton of play action and the browns are running the same amount of play action plays they did last year and you know the difference is is that the execution is not there it's not that it's too predictable it was predictable last year it's that the execution stinks compared to what it was last year this question comes from Yeezy for POTUS who says what position group do you see getting the biggest upgrade in the offseason my guess is the tight end room yeah yeah I, I'm gonna assume here that they're gonna try to get more athletic route runners in that tight end room more dynamic tight ends in that tight end room you know it might have been a good thing to do this year you could have got like a Giannu Smith or somebody like that they need a a tight end who can be a Mark Andrews or be what Jimmy Graham, not J yeah, Jimmy Graham used to be, um, and, and be one of those type tight ends. They don't have that. If they're going to run 12 personnel, that's fine, but you need one of those. Um, wide receivers, I think, is going to see an upgrade here because I think um, I, I think they need to move away from these shorter wide receivers. I know why you would want them in a Shanahan type system. Normally, that's what you have in a Shanahan type system. But I don't think the shorter wide receivers work with what the Browns are trying to do. Um, you know, a lot of these wide receivers have to block a lot. A lot of these wide receivers have to be physical. Um, I think you have to look at your wide receiving room, not as if you're running a Shanahan style offense and get those smaller guys that you usually get for those offenses. But I think you have to look at this wide receiving room as if you're going to run a West Coast offense right and the type of court right receiver that's perfect for a west coast offense is a guy like terrell owens or if like jarvis landry were like two inches taller and like 10 more pounds like that would be jarvis landry's perfect role or anquan bolden you know guys who aren't burners you know donovan people's jones actually fits the mode pretty well but guys who aren't burners but guys who are big strong targets that can be out there if you run the ball a lot and also you know can double as pseudo tight ends right they can do a chip block off the slot position and be actually effective off of it and they can make more spectacular kind of long grabs here and with baker he has a tendency to miss high i just think you need taller wide receivers at this point i think you're going to see uh, the skill positions get taller and you're going to see the tight end room get more athletic. The next question comes from Cam Vex, who says, what is the realistic shot for the Browns to make the playoffs if they can somehow turn it around after bye week? Or should we just shut people down and get ready for the draft? I am 100 percent never in favor of the just shut people down and get ready for the draft, because if you're in just shut down and get ready for the draft mode, you got a lot to learn about your team um, to the point to where you can't shut people down. Right. Like they got to play. You got to see what you got here with all the pieces that you have. So, no, nah, nah, Baker's got to go out there. Miles got to go out there. We got to see what we got here, man. We do. We got to see who needs to stay, who doesn't, um, if, if that's going to be the case. I, whether the Browns make the playoffs or not, I'm not sure. It's going to take a tremendous amount of luck, and they're going to have to turn this thing around in really quick order. Um, and they're going to have to one of the most mad. They're going to have to have one of the most magical bye weeks of all time uh, to get to the playoffs at this point. But what this season is now about is self improvement, right? Like, can you fix some of these things? Can you make some of these adjustments? Can you make this offense not be so awful by the end of the year? And can we see what? truly needs to be changed and what can stay this is going to be a information gathering thing for the offseason um and you know they need to take that as seriously as they would take a game if they were in playoff contention and technically they're still in it so you know yeah i play to the end next one comes from beep beep out of the way who says how much of the defense will be retained next season i hope they find a way to uh hold on to Clowney because he's been excellent um, you know, I think we've got lucked out that he's been healthy for most this year, knock on wood. But I think Clowney's been excellent. Malik McDowell, um, at all costs needs to be retained. I would really hope they would do that now, like they did the offensive linemen, but they need to retain uh, Malik McDowell. But 
Yeah, I think there's going to be a good amount of players that are going to be retained. And there already are a good amount of players that are already retained here. And the last question of the day comes from Kevin, who says, did Browns fans get caught up in the media Super Bowl team mantra for the Browns before the season started? Look, man, sometimes you have high expectations because at the time it's just reasonable to have high expectations. And I'm sorry. The high expectations for this Cleveland Browns team, absolutely warranted. Absolutely warranted to be excited. Absolutely warranted that people would think this could be a Super Bowl team. I stand behind everything I said in the offseason about this team because they definitely had the potential to do it. They definitely should have been able to do it. But nobody saw that they were going to come out and just not be good at football for whatever reason. Like, the expectations for the team get set up to a certain level. Because they should be. That's what you have on the roster. Those expectations should be high. It's up to the team to live up to that. Um, It's not anybody's fault if they don't live up to those expectations. That's not on that team. It's the team's fault. The expectations were reasonably set for this team. And they were set high. Because that's what the expectations should be. You made the playoffs. You won a playoff game. You almost beat the Kansas City Chiefs. Your expectations should have been high for this year. You were returning everybody. You made a ton of additions to the defense. Yes, the expectations should. It's not the media's fault. The expectations were high. And the Browns have disappointed you. The expectations were high because they should have been. And the Browns have just disappointed you. Like, that's what it is. It's nobody else's fault. This team was not overhyped from a roster standpoint. It was properly hyped. They just didn't live up to expectations because they have failed this year uh, so far, at the very least. So it's nobody's fault. Nobody maliciously hyped up the Browns. The Browns were hyped up because they should have been good this year. But, you know, they're 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 mediocre. So that's what it is. But thank you for the question, Kevin. But that's it for this week's Q&A. Again, guys, thank you guys for asking these questions. Have a great day. Have a good night.